Thank you, Seth, and good morning. <clears throat> good to be with you all again <clears throat> on this Sunday morning. Uh, we had a psalm last week, and I mentioned that I often like to do some psalms in between series. We finished Second Thessalonians, and so we did Psalm 96 last week. Doing another psalm this week, Psalm 97. And uh, in two weeks, we'll start a new series uh, in the gospel, eh, not the in the book of Judges, uh, the book of Joshua. I think I know what I'm talking about. But this morning, Psalm 97. So I'm going to read through it as we normally do, then we'll have a word of prayer. You'll notice, by the way, some of the similarities between this psalm and the things we spoke about last week and... Uh, that's uh, Psalm 96 and 97. So, the Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice. Let the many islands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries round about. The lightnings lit up the world, the earth saw and trembled. The mountains melted like wax at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. The heavens declare His righteousness, and all the peoples have seen His glory. Let those be ashamed who serve graven images, who boast themselves of idols. Worship Him, all you gods. Zion heard this and was glad. And the daughters of Judah have rejoiced because of your judgments, O Lord. For you are the Lord Most High over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. Hate evil, you who love the Lord, who preserves the soul of his godly ones. He delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Light is sown like seed for the righteous and gladness for the upright in heart. Be glad in the Lord, you righteous ones, and give thanks to His holy name. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of, of study in it and worship together. Let's bow together in prayer. In Romans 11... Verse 22, the Apostle Paul wrote, Behold then the kindness and severity of God. That sounds like a contradiction. Kind and severe, loving and harsh. But both are true and reveal the fullness of His character, which should produce fear of the Lord. C.S. Lewis gave an illustration of that in his book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, when one of the children learns that Aslan, the ruler of Narnia, is a lion. It's one of the girls, and she was surprised by that and nervous, so she asked, is he safe? Safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king. That fits the description of the Lord in Psalm 97. He is the king of the world, the ruler of the universe, the cosmos, which is like a mere speck of dust to him. He is described as surrounded by clouds and thick darkness. He lights up the world with flashes of lightning, makes the earth tremble and melts mountains. He's not a safe God, but He also rules in righteousness, preserves and delivers His saints. He gives them gladness. He is good. He's the King. That's Psalm 97, which is divided into four sections of three verses each. The first two are about the King. The second two are about the King's saints. In verses 1 through 3 is the revelation of God's goodness and severity. In verses 4 through 6 is the demonstration, examples of His goodness and severity. 
in verses 7 through 9 is the effect of that revelation on mankind, on the unbeliever and as well on the saint and the believer as well. And then in verses 10 through 12 is the exhortation to God's saints to respond to this great revelation. To hate evil and to be glad in the Lord. No name is attached to the psalm, not in the Hebrew Bible, but in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. The name of David is given. It's identified, he's identified as the author of the psalm, and there's no reason not to accept that. If there is an historical reason for the writing of the psalm, it's not stated either. It may be a great battle that David won, which the Lord overthrew his, in which the Lord overthrew his enemies and did so in a very spectacular, supernatural way, a demonstration of his great power. David's description of the Lord is taken from earlier theophanies, which are appearances of God, like the one at Sinai in Exodus 19, verse 16, when the mountain was covered in thick darkness, a thick, a thick cloud with thunder and lightning. The scene of the psalm is the battlefield. So it may be based on an historical event. It most likely is. Still, while it may be historic, it's mainly prophetic. A prophecy of the Lord's coming into the world to defeat the wicked. But that can only happen because who the Lord is. And the first verse of the psalm states that clearly, states his identity, who he is. And the fact is from what we see here, he is able to do the things that are promised in this psalm that have been revealed here, the promises here, because of who he is, he's the king. And the way he's described is the Lord reigns. He is king of the world, and he's coming to rule it. That's the theme of the psalm, and that has been the hope of God's people through the ages. That is reason to celebrate. That's what David encourages. Let the earth rejoice, let the many islands be glad. It is a universal invitation for the world to receive its king. The islands represented here, or described here, represent the far-flung parts of the earth beyond the horizon of the sea. Derek Kidner called them the remote innumerable outposts of mankind. What is shown in this and other psalms is the universal kingdom that God will establish. And David understood this. David was not provincial, narrow-minded in his thinking. He had a wide view of God's plan and purpose. The Lord had given him a large kingdom. In 2 Samuel 7, verses 8 through 11, the Lord reminded David that he had cut off all of his enemies to establish his kingdom. And it was a wide kingdom in the next chapter in 2 Samuel 8. There's a record of the victories uh, over the surrounding nations that have been given to David. David's conquest expanded Israel's kingdom from the border of Egypt to the Euphrates River. It was a large empire, but even that was limited to just a region of the Middle East. David looked beyond that to a worldwide kingdom to come. One that the Lord would establish that would include all the nations, even the islands, those distant outposts of humanity. He had a far-reaching vision of God's rule because he knew Scripture. This didn't come in a vacuum. He knew the Word of God. He understood the Abrahamic promise given in Genesis chapter 12 verses 1 through 3 in which God, God's promises include blessing for the nations as well as the nation, for the Gentiles as well as for Israel. 
But David could have confidence in that covenant God made with Abraham and the promises that are part of it because of the truth stated here in verse 1. The Lord reigns. He is sovereign. And that implies a whole range of divine attributes. God's omnipotence, God's omniscience, and His immutability, to just name three. He is powerful, all-powerful. If He were not all-powerful, if He were not omnipotent, He could not control all events, which He must be able to do in order to fulfill His promises. So he's all-powerful. If he did not know everything, if he were not omniscient, he would be surprised and frustrated by events. So he knows all things. If he could change, if he were not immutable, he would be undependable. But of course, he cannot change, cannot be frustrated. His plan is certain. He controls all the events of life and governs history completely. That is a a glorious truth. In fact, it is a liberating truth. He is sovereign and free, self-existent, not dependent upon anyone or anything, and that assures us that faith in Him will always be rewarded. We can rest in Him. So David begins his psalm with instruction for the earth, all the earth to rejoice. This was a call of the gospel. Rejoice in the king. Receive the king. This is good news for all the nations. They would be liberated. And the reason for joy is given in verse 2, his reign is righteous. Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Now that's a description of God's throne room, which is not actually a room, but the vast universe. In fact, it it is beyond the universe. He said in Isaiah 66, verse 1, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. The heavens, the universe, the cosmos is His throne. He's really beyond that. God is omnipresent. He is in everything, everywhere, in every atom, in every inch of this vast, vast universe. But He's beyond that. He's not only omnipresent, He's immense. He's beyond the universe. We cannot contain the Lord. He rules in awesome majesty. I don't know what other word to use in this case than awesome. It's a word that I think is probably well overused and as a result of that has lost much of its force, but it's the right word here. The the description here is probably taken from Exodus 19 verses 16 through 19 when Mount Sinai smoked and quaked and the people trembled in fear. No man can see God and live, so he must be hidden. And yet, he revealed himself. He revealed himself there at Sinai with the giving of the law. He has revealed himself through history, through the prophets and apostles. And the revelation that is especially relevant to this psalm is his righteousness and justice. He rules well. He is good. He is righteous. Right in character. Perfect. John wrote in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, God is light and in Him there is no darkness at all. He is truth and righteousness without flaw or imperfection. And so He acts with justice. He acts with fairness. He is the perfect King. That's reason for joy. That's reason for all of the nations to rejoice because the thrones of men have been largely tyrannical. Of all the places in the world where we would expect to find a righteous king, where we would expect to see godly rulers, it was Israel. 
But Isaiah in chapter 3 gives this word from the Lord where the Lord condemns the leaders of his land, condemns the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem. He says, they feed themselves well, but crush his people and grind the face of the poor. What a graphic picture of cruelty. Grinding the face of the poor. But how much truer that is of the nations, the Gentiles who dwell in darkness, without divine revelation. So much of history is the story of dictators who by conquest and oppression rule over people without justice. Ancient and modern history are filled with such things. And yet this king, the king of kings, the Lord God will rule on the earth with perfection, with justice and mercy. That's reason for joy, but also for fear. Verse 3 gives the reason for that because presently in his providence, he deals with those who oppose him. Fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries. That is his nature. That's his character. It, 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 it applies to us. The author of Hebrews said as much when he wrote in chapter 12, our God is a consuming fire, which warns us against taking the Lord lightly or our relationship with Him casually. There's nothing more serious in our life than our relationship with the Lord God. The author of Hebrews gives us counsel that we show gratitude by offering to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. Joy and awe go together. In fact, the more we know Him, the more we understand His character and His deeds, the more we will reverence Him with humble and godly fear. The next section of verses is a demonstration of what He has revealed about the Lord in a show of the Lord's power and majesty, His justice and mercy, His goodness and severity. Verse 4, His lightnings lit up the world, the earth saw and trembled, the mountains melted like wax at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord of, all, of the whole earth. The heavens declare His righteousness, and all the peoples have seen His glory. One commentator called this portion of the psalm a mosaic of the earlier literature, meaning David has used the accounts of the theophanies, the appearances of the Lord throughout the history of Israel, like, uh, like that on Mount Sinai, to describe what he witnessed on the battlefield. The, the victory was so spectacular that he drew upon other great events where the Lord showed his magnificent power in various ways in order to describe what had occurred in that battle that the Lord won for the nation. Now, if that is what David was celebrating in his psalm, it shows God's goodness to David in giving victory and his severity to his enemies in dealing out defeat. He is a fire to the unrighteous, not safe. But even if we, we understand this in a more general sense of God's display of power in nature, which I suppose we could take it in that sense, it still reveals that the whole earth is under His government, His rule, His authority. There is no escape from the Lord. He rules over all, which makes it urgent for the nations to submit, to rejoice, to receive Him as King. And in the next section, the third stanza of verses, David gives the effect of this revelation on both God's friends and foes. It brings rejoicing to Zion, but shame to the enemies. Verse 7, Let all those be ashamed who serve graven images, who boast themselves of idols, worship Him, 
all you gods. Now, I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible, which translates the verbs in that verse as imperatives or commands, be ashamed, worship. But they could also be indicatives, which simply states a fact. Uh, both these both had the same form as the forms of these verbs. I'm taking them as indicative. I think the psalmist is, is stating the consequence of God's victory on the battlefield. The translation would be, all who serve images are put to shame, who make their boast in worthless idols. All the gods prostrated themselves to him, to the Lord. In verse 9, David wrote, For you are the Lord of hosts over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. Now that doesn't assume the actual existence of the gods. Neither David nor any writer of the, uh, the Bible believed in polytheism, that there are many gods, or even henotheism, which is there's one God that is preeminent over all of the gods. They didn't believe in any of that. They're monotheists. They believed in one God. In the previous psalm, in fact, what we saw last week in Psalm 96, verse 5, David wrote, all the gods of the peoples are idols. In other words, they're meaningless. They're just sticks and stones. Robert Alter, who is a a Jewish scholar and has recently translated or published his translation of the Old Testament with some commentary, uh, translated this, they are ungods, not real. The faithful in Israel believe in only one God, the Lord, Yahweh. But the mention here of the gods has led modern scholars to conclude that the psalm is based on the imagery or the ideas of a Baal myth that was already old in David's day and believed by the pagans. David would have been very familiar with all of those myths. Well, in those old myths, Baal would march out from his holy mountain as a warrior shaking up nature defeat all rivals, and then return to his home victorious. Now, it's possible that David had that in mind, that David is writing with that as the background, and writing it, though, as a polemic, as an argument or an attack on paganism by turning their, their, their myth against them, using it to say, you believe in something that's foolish. The gods you believe in are defeated by the Lord God. He is God. Their defeat on the battlefield proved that. It resulted in, in the, the shame of these pagan armies and the proof that their gods are ungods. He pictures their idols or their false gods submitting to the Lord, bowing to the only real God. And that, by implication, is what the enemy should do. That should be their response. Heed the counsel of verse 1. Recognize that the Lord reigns and rejoice. Rejoice in Him. Believe in Him. Follow Him. That's what all of this is teaching. That's the, the force of this psalm. That's implied, the implied exhortation here by the, the revelation of God. That's the result that should be produced but doesn't always do that. Doesn't always have that result of bringing people to recognize the folly of their unbelief and looking to the Lord and falling down before Him and worshiping Him. Sometimes it has the opposite effect. I think it was Spurgeon who said, the same sun which melts wax hardens clay. And the same gospel which melts some persons to repentance hardens others in their sins. Uh, this revelation caused, caused God's people to rejoice. Verse 8, Zion heard this and was glad. And the daughters of Judah have rejoiced because, your judgments, because of your judgments, O Lord. Verse 9, for you are the Lord most high over all the earth. 
And that reminds us again of the vision or the scope of this psalm. It is all the earth. It is worldwide. Again, this is not only a a psalm based on an historical event. It is also prophetic in its intent. James Boyce wrote, Whatever the immediate historical reference might be, the only complete fulfillment of this vision must be the eventual return of Jesus Christ and the reign of Jesus in the millennial kingdom at the end of this age. And descriptions of the day of the Lord in the prophets and the gospels are very similar to the display given here in verses 4 and 5. Lightnings flashing, the earth trembling and melting. That day is coming. Dr. Boyce wrote, Only then will perfect justice come to this earth. There is no such thing as perfect justice now. That's true. So what do we do? Well, we continue on in this fallen world, fighting the good fight in the spiritual battle that is always going on around us. And we fight it. We fight it in the everyday mundane ways of life. We get up in the morning to be where we're supposed to be, doing what we're supposed to be doing. We daily live to the glory of God by being responsible citizens of this land and of heaven of which we are citizens. We lead a quiet life. We work. We attend to our own business, managing our own homes, training our children, providing for ourselves, and helping those in need. That's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28. That's 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 11. That's the basic Christian life. It's a daily life. It may seem routine, but if, if we cannot be faithful in the basic simple things of life, we will be failures in the great opportunities of faith. This is how the apostles instruct us to live. Glorifying God in the rudimentary, regular things of life. That is the right way to live. That is the the way over time that gets the attention of the world. People value a responsible consistent, trustworthy life. That's the life we're to live, but it's not a simple life. It can't be. We are living in a spiritual battle. We are living in an invisible war that is constant all around us. A a spiritual conflict conflict that is just as real as a hot war, but very subtle with influences that constantly exert pressure on us to conform in almost imperceptible ways. That's the battle. What Paul warns of in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, after 11 chapters of doctrine, he gives the exhortation, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. worship. And do not be conformed to this world. Now that's David's exhortation in the final stanza of the psalm in which he encourages the saints to hold on until victory comes. But it's not an exhortation to, to hold on with a kind of grim resignation. Just the opposite. It is two exhortations, the first in verse 10, which is very direct. Hate evil, you who love the Lord. And the second in verse 12, be glad in the Lord, you righteous ones. So, we're to be happy warriors. Still, we're to be determined warriors for Christ and the church. And that is made very clear in the first command. Hate evil. That that sounds militant. And it is. It's a 
a militant psalm that we're studying, one written after a great military victory over some enemy, the Moabites or the Ammonites or some idolatrous people. The, the worldview of David's day was idolatry. Everyone accepted it. A psalm like this was something very unusual. The world accepted without debate that there are many gods and they affect everything. It's almost like pantheism. They're the gods of the harvest, the gods of the rain, gods for everything. The gods of El and Baal and Anat and uh, many, many others. Whole pantheons of false gods, figments of man's twisted imagination. David opposed that without compromise. He reminded this defeated people of how demolished they were and how ridiculous they appeared for trusting in such a foolish idea. He wasn't gloating. He was enlightening. He was showing them the right way. He began with the basic gospel. The Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice. He's telling them to do that, to repent, turn from idols which are ungod's and trust in and rejoice in the one true God, the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah. Still, he makes it clear and gives evidence of it that their ideas are empty, false, and destructive. He, he made no compromise with error, unlike his son Solomon, who ended compromising with the idols. That's how powerful the enemy is. That's how powerful the spirit of the age is, that Solomon, the wisest man in the world, the wisest man of history, could be taken in and fall to the subtleties of the worldview of his day. Now, it's a powerful enemy that we face and, and why we must be vigilant in our opposition to error today. It's not Baal or Moloch or Jupiter that we deal with today. It's, it's other things. It's other gods, other, other false religions, materialism, humanism, which really are every bit of religion as Hinduism and Islam and any of the others. That's the spirit of the age, the zeitgeist. It has a powerful, subtle, constant influence upon us. But there's no room for compromise. Alexander Pope was no believer, but he wrote an insightful rhyme or poem, a set of verses. You've probably heard it. I've read it before, but it's this. Vice is a monster of so frightful mean, meaning appearance, as to be hated needs but, needs but to be seen, yet seen too oft, familiar with her face, we first endure then pity, then embrace. That's true. It's a, an observation of general wisdom, proverbial wisdom. It, it is so easy to become comfortable with sin, to become accepting of it, especially when it is so common and so openly accepted. But Pope's warning is just that. It's a warning. It doesn't have the solution. The, the lure of the forbidden has a power that, that draws us to look again and make our peace with evil. We need grace to overcome that. We need sovereign grace. And it is obtained in only one place, in only one person, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. In those, it is those who, who love the Lord who will resist conformity. And they will do it because they love the Lord. When we love Him, we love who He is, and we love what is pleasing to Him and what is right to Him. We cannot love the Lord and love evil. And we cannot hate evil by making ourselves hate it. We hate it because we love Him. In fact, it is by knowing Him and, and filling our minds with Him, who He is and, and what He has done, what He has taught, 
that the attraction of evil, of sin, is displaced by the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is power in knowing Him. But that takes effort on our part because we know Him by knowing His Word. We know Him by knowing the Scriptures. That's fundamental to the, the vital, actual relationship that we sustain with the Lord. Those who love the Lord entered into a personal relationship with Him through faith. We are joined to Him and His life is joined to us. It's a supernatural life, as I often say. But we cultivate that relationship and that life within us through the knowledge of the Word of God, through the Bible. And it's that simple and it's that demanding. Sinclair Ferguson wrote in his book, Devoted to God, there's no immediate pathway to getting to know God's Word intimately. There's no quick fix. We can only do this the old-fashioned way by reading it often and learning it well. The remedy, he said, is soaking ourselves frequently in God's Word. That's true. So let's get after it. That would be the implication. Now to this exhortation to hate evil, to stand firm against the, the tide of the world and the spirit of the age, David adds these encouraging words in the last, uh, the rest of verse 10 and verse 11. The Lord whom we love preserves the souls of His godly ones. He delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Light is sown like seed for the righteous and gladness for the upright in heart. The Lord is with us. We know that by faith, but that's the promise of the Word of God. He never sends us out to fight His battles, that He is not with us and helping us and more, enabling us to do well. He preserves us, I think is better translated, He guards us. He guards the souls or the lives of His faithful. The Lord promises to watch over us and defend us. So we are able to live by faith, not compromise, but, but stand for the truth, for the gospel. We're able to do that because, as I said, it's a supernatural life that we live. Warn the rebels of the danger of their way and direct them in the way of life, which is in Christ and faith in Him. That's the gospel. That's what we're to be doing, living and giving. And we do it in love, not in anger. We do it in love. We are counseled to do that by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 4.15. We're not to be taken in by, and fooled by, by men and by the, the craftiness of the evil one and by the spirit of this age, but we are to speak the truth in love. That's how we are to deal with the world around us. Speaking the truth and love, we are to grow up in Christ. That's Paul's counsel. And the promise is, the Lord will light our path. I think that's a, an interesting, beautiful way of putting it in verse 11. Light is sown like seed for the righteous. It gives the picture of the Lord like a farmer casting out seed, but before his path as he goes to sow it throughout the field. And, and as we walk by faith, the Lord sows light before us. He lights our path as we walk in obedience to Him. He directs our way and fills us with gladness. So David gives the, the final exhortation in verse 12. Be glad in the Lord, you righteous ones, and give thanks to His holy name. The psalm that began with rejoicing ends with rejoicing. Be thankful because the Lord is always there, guarding us, lighting our way, and delivering us. And be glad because not only is He presently blessing us, He's coming again, and He'll win the victory. He is literally coming again, physically on the clouds, 
in all his glory to defeat decisively the wicked and set up his kingdom and righteousness over all the earth. We are more than conquerors, as Paul said. Regardless of the difficulties of life, and we go through hard and challenging times, nevertheless, the end will come and it will be triumphant for us and we will be rewarded for our faithfulness. So hold on and do more. Fight the good fight. The Lord is with us. That is His goodness, His kindness. He is kind and good to us in abundance. Kind and good to those who love Him, to His godly ones. But there is also His severity. Behold then, Paul said, the kindness and severity of God. He's severe with the ungodly. He's patient with them. This is the day of His patience. But He will deal with sinners. And He will deal with them justly in His time. Ignoring that, dismissing the Lord is foolish. The Lord is good. God is love. But for the unbeliever, the rebellious, those who think they can live life their way, He's dangerous. David began with an invitation to the world at large. The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Lay down your weapons, he's saying. Abandon your idols. Come to Christ in whom is life eternal. He died for the likes of you. He died for sinners, taking their sins upon himself and undergoing the full punishment of them now all one must do is believe in Him. All one can do is believe, is receive the gift of life through faith alone. And the Lord God promises to receive everyone who does that. May God help you to do that if you've not believed in Him. And you who have, I hope it's everyone here, rest in the great truth that He reigns now and He's going to rule upon the earth in the days to come. So may God keep us faithful and active in fighting the good fight of faith. Well, we're going to close in a word of prayer and prepare ourselves for the Lord's Supper following the prayer. So I'm going to, to pray for that as well as pray the Lord's blessing on us for our time together in this hour. Let's pray. Father, we do thank You for Your goodness to us. And we're reminded of your greatness. We're reminded of your sovereignty, uh, the sovereignty of the triune God. And we look around and it's a dark age in which we live. There's unrest. There's injustice. And yet it's always been that way. There's really nothing unusual essentially in the time we're living from other times. It's just a fallen world. But you've placed us here <clears throat> to be lights in the midst of it, and I pray that we will do that. We will be your ambassadors. We will represent you. We will live and give the gospel in our word and deed, and we will be faithful, stand faithful through difficult times to the end. So bless us, Lord, with that. We have much grace abounding to us. It's your goodness and kindness to us. And we have that based upon the work of your Son, what He did for us in our place when He came the first time as a servant, not as a king, but as one who served His, peop per his people and gave His life a ransom for many. And through that death, He obtained life for us. Father, as we now turn our attention to this Lord's Supper, may we remember that. It is given in order for us to remember what He did for us. And we need to remember that weekly. And as we remember it, Father, prepare us for the day and the week before us that we would live lives of service for You. And we would bring glory to You in all that we do. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Preparation for taking the Lord's Supper. Let's stand and sing number 41. 
in your handout or in the Songs of Praise book, Behold the Lamb. Reading from 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. The apostle assures us, uh, all those here who have trusted in Christ and received by faith the benefits of his saving death on the cross, that we are quite wealthy people. Of course, he means not material riches, but the more important and lasting windfall that has come to us by virtue of his love and grace and at the precious cost of Jesus Christ's own sacrifice described here in the verse I just read figuratively as his becoming poor and embracing poverty in exchange for our bounty. It's what we often hear called the great exchange. Our sins uh, laid upon him, him being made poor. His righteousness uh, counted as ours. There's our riches. Uh, the punish we, punishment we deserve uh, borne by him. There's his poverty. Uh, the pardon he purchased with his own blood granted to us. There's our, our great wealth. It's the heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul put it another way in Philippians chapter 2 where he accurately depicted the Lord Jesus have, as having existed in the form of God, but not grasping onto it for dear life, but rather emptying himself by becoming a man and becoming obedient to the mission that was devised by our triune God from eternity past, that he would die on a cross. And that precipitated a cascade of blessings we read there in Philippians chapter 2, his being exalted to the right hand of his Father, his glory uh, restored to him, and his becoming the object of the worship of every living being. And not the least, making this celebration that we have before us not uh, just a memorial, but a, a feast, a veritable a feast. We are the rich, Paul says, and now in our hearts we are to ponder that and, and celebrate that in the way that our Lord instructed us as we partake now of this bread and uh, the cup with wine. We remember uh, what the Lord said when he inaugurated this supper. He broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body given for you, the impl implication there of what a gift that he gave his body for us. Do this, he said, in remembrance of me. And then in a moment, uh, Dan will come up and we'll partake of the cup. And we remember that the Lord Jesus uh, held up the cup and said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. A great gift. Uh, making us rich in salvation. Well, let us give thanks now uh, for the bread. Father, we thank you for the opportunity you give us to remember the Lord Jesus in this way. Thank you for sending him. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your willingness to uh, become poor, uh, to undergo poverty, spiritual uh, poverty on, on our behalf so that we might uh, gain this great wealth, forgiveness of sins, uh, the benefits of your righteousness uh, imputed to us. Lord, will you give us grace now to remember in a worthy way uh, such sacrifice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to read from Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14, and then make just a few comments on the passage. 
For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Jesus Christ is our great God and Savior. There's no more important statement in the Bible than that. He is both God and man in one person. He is both perfect and powerful. He is guiltless, sinless. And yet, as Mark reminded us, and as Paul reminds us here again, as the Lord said, we hear in verse 14, He gave Himself for us to redeem us. His life was not taken from Him. The cross was no mistake of history. He gave Himself for us. The innocent for the guilty. The Creator for the creature. God for man. That is an amazing thing. But a necessary thing. Only in this way could we be saved. There was no other way. We were lost and helpless and guilty. So He became a man to die for us and redeem us, to buy us out of our hopeless condition by paying our debt in our place, removing our sin and our guilt by His own substitutionary death. And in doing that, He made something of us. He made something of us wrecked and ruined sinners, something that is valuable. He purified us for His possession Zealous for good deeds. When we come to this holy table, we do so to remember what He did. That's what He instructed us to do. Do this in remembrance of Me. He died to save the lost, to, to remove our guilt, to deliver us from judgment, and give us lives that are full of good deeds. We remember that too. We're not saved simply to heaven. We've been saved to a new life. We're changed people. We're new people. That's the purpose of the cross. This table reminds us of that. So may God give us the, the, the grace this week to live that new life. So if Christ comes this week, our blessed hope, He will find us doing those good deeds and showing the world what the Savior has done. May God help us to do that. Let's bow and give thanks for the cup. Father, we do thank You for this cup that represents the blood shed by Your Son, uh, the great sacrifice, the, the great cost, a cost of infinite value, one that we cannot begin to comprehend or fathom. We thank you for that great price that was paid for our salvation. Saved us from wreck and ruin to give us a glorious future, an eternal future, eternal life. And yet, that life doesn't begin in the future. It's already begun. We're new creatures. And you've, been given, you've given us a life that is to be characterized with a zeal for good works. So Lord, we know we're not saved by those works, but those are the consequence of being saved. And may we live those out in this life. May we be good witnesses this week for you. And may this time of celebration of the cost that was paid for that life for us be remembered at this moment and throughout the week. We thank you for your son's death, for what it's accomplished for us who are debtors to mercy alone. Pray these things in his name. Amen. Well, once again, it's been a joy to see all of you here and to be with you. I hope you have a happy Labor Day and a fruitful week. Let me close with the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face 
shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. In the Lord, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Keep looking to Christ, the author and perfecter of faith, and hopefully we'll see you next week.